What's going on, everybody, and welcome to the other side of the Firewall Podcast, where we talk about the latest and greatest in cybersecurity news, as well as we highlight those movers and shakers and glass ceiling breakers, those people of color who made it to the other side of the proverbial firewall. My name is Ryan Williams, and as always, I'm joined by Shannon Tynes. What's up? What's up? Chris Abacon. What's going on, everybody? And Daniel Isavedo. How's it going, guys? What's going on? So welcome to the podcast. So Monday and Tuesday are topics. Wednesday, just like this episode, is our discussion. Thursdays, Ask a CISSP. And then Fridays, everything else. So movies, books, games, all that good stuff. So a whole week's worth of content. Even I say that and I didn't release last Fridays. So it got lost in the, in the sauce. So I need, to, I need to probably do that today to get ahead of next Fridays. But hit up all the websites uh, that go by our name. Uh, the main website from here on out will be ramcyber.io. Check out all the platforms we're on, the other side of the firewall, the other side of the FW, or Ask CISSP are the names we go by. But without further ado, I give it to Shannon. All right, everybody. So this article comes from APnews.com, okay? Um, and it's written by a few people. Wyatt Grantham Phillips, Michael Bicicker, Sarah L. De- L. Deeb, and Sarah Parvini. And the title of this one is, What to Know About the Two Waves of Deadly Explosions That Hit Lebanon and Syria. So we're not going to get into the geopolitics of this, right? So there is stuff going on in the world if you're paying attention. But what we're hitting on is the cyber aspect of this, right? So like, if you've been paying attention, there was there were some attacks that were implemented using old technology as in pagers, right? Pagers, which I had when I was back in high school. I didn't know they were still in use, but apparently they are and walkie-talkies for communication, right? So with this cybersecurity usage of what was going on for this, like this is one of those things where you can't ever leave it to yourself to forget about things that are out there and just think that it's only the new technology, right? Because we talk about this, right? Like we talk about how uh, when it comes to the internet of things and these new technologies and these super updated, you know, it could be your washing machine, your refrigerator, your aquarium thermostat, like all these things that are new technology is what we talk about mostly because that's what we're seeing. It's a lot of those being attack vectors for things that are going on. Well, don't forget about the old technology, right? When we say don't forget about the old technology, like the way that this came off is more of a supply chain attack, right? Like you have to be, have to have physical access to these things to be able to carry out this attack how it is. But that is still a real thing, right? Like we've talked about supply chain attacks before when I think it was, was it Peloton? I think is what we talked about before where we had this, the supply chain attack and it was also the solar winds. One was supply chain, right? Right. Uh, I don't. I don't remember several Peloton. years ago. Yeah. Peloton, yeah, so, 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 solar pl- solar winds was for sure, but I think the Peloton was one was too. I'd have to maybe misremembering that. I could be wrong on that, but Peloton had one as well where they had a vulnerability that I thought was supply chain. I could be wrong on that. So sorry, Peloton. If I am, I know your stock is dropping. No, 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 like, like I got crazy. Peloton sitting right behind me. I, no, like, like, <laughs> I, 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 could, I, could, I could be wrong on that, right? But, but uh, no, like it it is a thing that that has to be worried about, right? So like. You can't just assume because something is a new technology that it is the only thing that's being that's being gone after. Like anything can be got when it comes to it being a supply chain attack. You know what I'm saying? So we just have to be careful out there with everything. And again, we're not getting into the geopolitics of this, but this was used for for the purposes of of, of taking on. A, do you want to really want to call them a nation state? I don't know how we. I don't know how they're classified, right? But to to go against an opposing an opposing uh, faction. We'll say that, right? That's accurate to say. But yeah, um, people be careful out there, right? Like if you if you're out there doing dirt, they can get you, right? They can they can come after you however they need to. And again, I didn't know pagers were in in that much use in this day and age. Even even with doctors, do doctors even use pagers anymore? Like with the cell phone and everything like that? Like I think they do. Actually. Like, do they still? I, I think they so. Do. Yeah, because cell phone technology kind of interferes sometimes with the medical equipment, so that's okay. why. And also, hospitals tend to not have great signal. So that's why they have that's why they have pagers okay a runaway signal device so that way if it's an emergency they need to get in contact they'll receive the page either go into surgery or there's an emergency things like that so i've been in hospitals and usually they just page them over the intercom you know also, what I mean? like i've never yeah. i've never seen them with like let me say this and I, i'm not in hospitals for surgery a lot right so like <laughs> that's, that's not something that i'm in there for a lot to notice it but like i almost always hear them getting paged over the pa system to where i just thought pagers were not a thing you know, to use it because like there comes a point where like the companies that, that will actually support that will be like, okay, it's just not worth it. It's like pay phones, right? Like you don't see pay phones yeah. out in the street anymore because it's like there's yeah, no money true. made in that. They use them also in facilities or in places where signals aren't good. Mm-hmm. 
but you need to have communications, also, but you can't have your phone. Right. So sometimes you get permissions or you get special special requirements if they have pictures. And it's a one-way transmission too, right? So yeah, like exactly. you're, in a, you're in a place where you can't have the two-way communication. And, and yeah, the big exactly. thing is that they're a, they're at lower lower band and frequency, and because of that, uh, they can traverse through walls and, and get through. It's like it's like um like AM FM, right? Why, why like radios everywhere? They're they're using similar. I, th I think I'm googling it real quick. Uh, I think the commercial paging operates according to the FCC operates at 35 to 36 megahertz. Uh, 43 to 44, 152 to 159, and then um, to 460. So those are all relatively low, right? Compare that to you know um, what what is it for um, like like Wi-Fi, right? Wi-Fi is like two 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 thousand. It's 2.4 gigahertz, right? 2.4, so yeah, yeah, 2.4 and up to and five, five. So that, that's got yeah. less penetration from that from that standpoint. So you're, what what I what I hear from what you guys are telling me is that if I go into Verizon today today and say show me your latest pagers, they're gonna have a bunch of them shown out there. Is that, that I, like, no, I don't. I don't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> who I don't who still makes things. pagers today? Let's let's I, Google. Yeah. Yeah. Motorola used to be big back in the day. I mean, you know, I I don't know. I, I you don't. I don't know if you see as many Motorola phones out there. So maybe they just held on to that to be like, hey, this is what they do. But anyway. Chris, what's your thoughts on this, man? <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, my thoughts are from the supply chain risk management standpoint. It's like the first thing that came to mind was, hey, what can we do to leverage um, like our our frameworks and our, our resources that we have here in the states, right? So here we've got, for example, NIST provides 853 revision five, which does have supply chain risk management as one of its domains. And if you notice, um, the kind of trend that NIST is going is that they're going towards that governance. Right, they've added governance to the CSF 2.0. Right, they're going towards the supply chain risk management and even, um, you know, implementing this into like FedRAMP requirements and things like that. So it's really urging anybody with government or whomever that has these requirements, hey, look into your supply chain risk management processes. So just just an example, looking into 853, they've got a supply chain risk management plan, which can, can include third party risk management reviews. You know, making sure you're asking a company that you're going to work with questionnaires, like sending them a question, a cybersecurity questionnaire, like, hey, do you guys have this? Do you guys implement, um, you know, multi-factor authentication, stuff like that? Asking them if they've got any current certifications like that. Another interesting one that is probably relevant is the acquisition strategies and tools and methods, right? So, like, what, how do they acquire? How can you as a company acquire? Certain tools, certain you know, if you, if you got a data center, where are you getting your stuff from? Is it from an authorized dealer? Is it from a, is it from the supplier itself, or is it from you know, random guy that can get you a deal down the street, right? Giving you fake Cisco switches like here, as a the guy that yeah. in Florida, right? So there's that to consider, making sure your vendors are legitimate, and then what here? There's a high baseline control called tamper resistance and detection. Right? How do you know that something has been tampered with? Right? So that, that's a control probably more along the lines of like for, for companies that produce things, right? Um, but it can be applicable at least to this situation, right? Hey, it might have been it might have behooved you know this party to inspect what they got prior to you know deploying it to the entire ecosystem, right? And that's that's when the trouble happens. You know, staying away from the geopolitics, and and then there's ins inspection of systems or components. It's really just making sure that you're conducting vendor due diligence and do and practice due care when it comes to things like this. Like it's it's almost like a zero trust. Like, hey, how do I know what I have is is legit, right? And if I mean, it's it's very risk averse this mindset, but in this day and age when you've got potential supply chain issues at all layers of the OSI mall, right? Like you've got application security. You got to make sure that that's legit, right? You can get into a lot of trouble if, if you were just signing agreements with a company or, you know, organization that doesn't have their stuff together. And I think that's kind of like the big takeaway from here as well. Another really good control here, uh, at least highlighting uh, supply chain is, is competent component authenticity, making sure all your stuff is legitimate, looking for the signs, looking for the certifications, looking for the little watermarks or whatever they have on authentic Cisco uh, circuit boards, right? There's clear indications of that when you open that stuff up. So it's, uh, it's, there's, there's a lot to it at that. Um, but yeah, those are my thoughts. Daniel, what are your thoughts? 
Yeah, this is a pretty sophisticated attack. I mean, not to go down a, a rabbit hole with what you were saying, but I do. There's a, there's a lot that goes into acquisitions and mm -hmm. supply chain and procurement. And as an organization matures, those departments have their own like checklist and checks and balances that go alongside what this does. And supply chain is a really big issue right now in, in the U.S. government. So before I transitioned to my current job, job I was working before. The whole like last six months of last year and the first couple of months of this year was dedicated to focusing on supplier control, all the smaller supply chains that we get materials and stuff from, doing deep dives with them, seeing what their cybersecurity postures were, kind of seeing what their kind of like their ledger, like what are your postures, what are you, what's your playbooks look like, these kind of things. Um, and it's just yeah, it, it, it's a very big focus right now. And looking behind the curtain and, and sitting alongside with some of the procurement and supply chain people and purchasing people in my business, I learned a lot. There is a lot of checks and balances for a developed organization. But where the wrench pair, I don't know if I'm using that term correctly, comes from is from these small organizations, right? That are trying to make money and where they get their materials from and how stringent they are on procuring and buying stuff, right? And usually where things go rise through them, right? Either their networks aren't secure or it's easy to sell those people things that aren't authentic or that have faulty things in it because they ha can't do as much checks and balances. But that's, just, that's we're a, just, we're just don't have the money, right? Like, they're trying to be not do their due diligence. It's just, they don't have the sophistication as a large, a large organization yeah. will have. But not to make turn this whole podcast into like a supply chain, like like TED Talk, but but there, there is a lot that goes into that, right? It's not just a one thing from their DOD. There's like like a whole organization structure behind just those specific things as well. That's very mature. But this man, this is this is like uh, you know an HBO blockbuster spy movie kind of thing. <laughs> like, the level of sophistication it takes to do an attack like this and timing the simultaneousness of it. This wasn't done, like, this wasn't something that they decided to do over a weekend, right? Like, in the article to it, it could take in months or even years. I would side with a year or more. And the level of intelligence gathering, and the thing is, the craziness about things like this is, it's an easy thing to exploit. It's very low level. It's hard to detect. And then also, to just, like, we're working with, uh, not barcode scanners, we're RFID uh, scanners right now at my job. We're doing a project. That they could have done something like even the RFID and been able to track everything like that, which is very low level also. And you wouldn't really even notice it. And if it goes past one of the RFID readers, you know where all the stuff is. Almost like you're geomapping, like air tagging everything. And then once everything is set up how you want it, then you can execute. It's, it's kind of crazy because it's actually not that difficult to do. Like if you take all the individual parts separate and then put them together like a puzzle, like the where the where the real sophistication comes is from like the intelligence scattering of like knowing where the targets are and distributing everything and then also embedding all the stuff in the supply chain. That's kind of crazy. This is straight out of like a spy novel. It sucks, but it just shows you kind of like at every level of the business, right, there has to be defenses and we have to be gatekeepers, you know. Us as cybersecurity speakers and pushers of the envelope of this arena. What we can do is just hopefully instruct and get to people's ears so they know that hey, what you do in your own house, how you take care of your stuff and how you take care of your work stuff translate greatly, right? You're like closing a door for these guys to come in. But supply chain is going up. Chat GPT, just to give you like a quick rundown of the last three years, like supply chain attacks. And it gave me solar winds, case of VSA ransomware, which was the cameras, Log4j shell was also a supply chain thing. A cellular FTA breach, which I don't remember that one, Colonial Pipeline. Microsoft Exchange Server hack, and then code COV supply chain, which I don't remember what that one is. So, I mean, those are just like seven, it, it started running off. And I, cause I asked it for the last three years and they just kept on giving me, and I was like, stop, that's enough. Like, I need more. And it's going to keep going because, you know, it just shows like for me, the big ones are this one, the Colonial Pipeline, anything that'll attack like the masses or like infrastructure that could take out like energy and things like that. I think they're. There's like a real danger there that people's not like me are looking at, but I think is where we really need to shift our focus, especially in supply chain. But so as you're, 
real quick before you i know you're getting ready to hand it over it yeah. seems like you're getting handed over yeah. but, so i had to look up the peloton thing so it was a potential it was a, it had a potential for it with the vulnerability that it had we, we did this article it was like three years ago ryan when we did this mm-hmm. uh but it was talking about peloton and one of one of the uh vulnerabilities they had and it got reported to them and it was like hey this could have the potential to be a supply chain attack if you don't you don't patch this up and it was a matter of people putting uh, the fake applications on the system is what it was. Mm-hmm. So it was not an actual supply chain attack. Peloton, yeah, I apologize. Peloton. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, you don't have stock. <laughs> don't have stock. Yeah. Hey, don't get in, get in, now. Get in don't now because it's, it's, it's been dropping. Get in now so that if it doesn't right. go up, that's how you make money, right? But I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead, man. Ryan, tell you yes. No, I appreciate it. So uh, again, so ramcyber.io uh, will be the end of all the things, right? So the, the podcast is a product of ramcyber. And if you would like to advertise or be a sponsor uh, or do any marketing with us, please hit me up. I am at rwilliams at rampcyber.io. So send me, I don't have the podcast email address set up just quite yet because I have nine to five. So sorry, but I definitely want to start getting some uh, sponsorship and marketing flowing through the podcast um, because I think we have a lot of great content. I, I believe it will then give you the eyes and ears of a very di- diverse um, niche uh, market. So our audience is awesome. So definitely check us out. With all that out of the way, this is a very extreme example of supply chain mismanagement, right? So it's it's very hard to, as as a, a consultant to use this as an example because uh, it, it does conjure emotions and things of that nature, right? When I talk about supply chain mismanagement, things of that nature, I, I typically go by a use case that was at uh, uh, work when I was active duty, right? So uh, we had a tech refresh, things came in. Uh, it was a couple pallets of laptops. The next day or so, OSI rolls up and says, hey, put those in the back of our truck. And give us all the documentation that came with these. Uh, because of software agreements, you have to purchase from local vendors, things of that nature, but you still have to do your due diligence to make sure that they're not sourcing uh, components from our uh, near peers and enemies. So it was a matter of like, where these laptops come from, right? They're they're met by a, a major name brand company, but are they refurbished? Like who had their hands in this this tech and things of that nature? And because of that, it tied up a tech refresh for a very long time. And thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars were lost because of it, right? Uh, just because of the mismanagement of it. So now you take this extreme example of threat intelligence, counter threat intelligence, things of that nature not being implemented uh, at least properly or not not having the skill or ability to implement those and it wreaks havoc two days and now weeks and weeks and weeks of havoc, right because people lost their lives uh, due to this so again extreme example of how uh, the breakdown of supply chain can can cause issues but it's a reminder uh, because like me and me and chris went to technet a couple years ago like i'm not sure if you went this year or not but uh, when when you and i went to Augusta, we talked to Lidos. And Lidos, I believe it was Lidos, right? Lidos is the one that had the supply chain like um, from cradle to grave. Like this is where the mind, the mine where they got the silicon and other components all the way to it being dropped off at your company and now everybody in between. Like, and, and they also had threat intelligence in between to let them know like, hey, if this was being sourced from enemy, if at some point somebody in the supply chain touched that should not have, or if down to civil unrest. So you may have uh, supply scarce, scarcity because it, components are being sourced through this country that's currently having issues, right? So you might want to go with a different vendor so that way you don't have to rely on um, or not be able to get your tech refresh or your whatever. So there, there's a lot that goes into this. It's an entire industry in itself. Uh, but then you see in this extreme example, like there either was no implementation or there was lots of holes uh, in their implementation and no counterintelligence, no OSI equivalent pulled up and said, hey, put those walkie talkies and pagers in the back of our truck because we don't know where you got them from or there's a problem with it. Right. Instead, they fielded these pieces of equipment and tech and then a chaos ensued once the the whomever the attacker was decided to, to detonate it. And this is not. And the technology being implemented in this way is not old. Or that's not new, I should say. It's 
uh, what was being done in Iraq when we were there in Afghanistan and things of that nature. Like they were remotely detonating bombs using pagers and walkie talkies as well. So this has been a thing for at least two decades plus already, right? Someone got, got lax in this uh, situation and, and that's what caused this to happen. But it's also a great reminder of like, you need to, like in this case, you don't have to worry about, you know, at least I hope not in the States, you know, your laptop blowing up or something like that. But you do need to know where this stuff uh, was sourced from, things of that nature, uh, to, to make sure you don't get, you know, added to a botnet or receive a virus or something like that. Like, do you have questionnaires? Are you vetting your third parties? Are you following the CSF and the uh, 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 153 Rev, Rev 5? Are we up to Rev 5 now? Rev 5, yeah. Yep. Yeah, Rev 5. Like, are you following this guidance? Are you you're doing your due diligence? You do care and things of that nature. Because bad things can happen because of it. Mm. Yeah. But, so that's where I land on it, right? Um, but yeah, it was, it was crazy. Like, so when I saw it, I was like, I don't know if I want to touch it. But I think that there, there, there can be some components of this topic that can be used in application here in the States. Or whomever is listening, right? Like sometimes we get spikes, like Taiwan, Singapore, uh, the UK, where our listenership grows exponentially. For I don't know why, but I'll take it. Right? Go to ramcyber.io. <laughs> but this pretty much wraps this one up. Again, we tried to stay away from the geo geopolitical in this and just try to give you some practical application that comes out comes out of this type of story. And it, it was a supply chain attack and a cyber attack all wrapped in the one. So it's pretty uh, sophisticated attack that took place. So definitely hit up all the websites to go by our name. Uh, you can hit us up at ramcyber.io. You can go to our uh, social medias, the other side of the firewall, the other side of the FW, or ask a CISSP. Give me a personally at RyRy Security Guy. That's R-Y-R-Y Security Guy. You can find me on LinkedIn. And where can we find you, Chris? You can find me on LinkedIn under my name, Chris Abacon, last name spelled A Bacon. And you, Daniel? On LinkedIn under my name, Daniel Acevedo. There it is. Stay safe. Stay secure.